Hi guys, Tom Bo McGrath here. After my last article and uh, series of videos on buoy knife design, I received some interesting questions. Uh, two I'd like to address here are, uh, one was the use of the back cut and when it's used. Is it used in uh, forward grip or is it used with the edge up grip as Jim Bui uh, was supposed to have used? And a lot of that comes down to how your blade is designed. So we'll look at that more briefly. So here we have a windless steel craft um, copy or version of a Confederate uh, American Civil War buoy. Uh, it has an 18 inch blade and it has a D guard. And obviously something like that would prevent you from holding it in edge up grip. You know, you really, it's, it's very awkward to hold it like that. And your uh, cutting edge, your back false edge is not lined up with your knuckles for a proper cut. So you're going to be holding it in standard grip, obviously. So from here, that, that scooping back cut or that snap makes a lot of sense, uh, especially with a blade this long. Um, you will get a lot of uh, bang for your buck, let's say, a lot of velocity on that tip with that longer tip. And it makes sense to do that with a longer blade. Now here we have an Ontario SP10 Raider buoy as a 9.5 inch blade. Um, and it has a wide enough blade that that back swedge can be sharpened. So this to me makes a lot more sense to use um, for the edge up style of fighting that uh, Jim Bowie was supposedly to use. Um, so you're, when you're in here, you have enough reach, you have enough weight. You know, this is a fairly heavy buoy at a quarter inch in stock. So you can get a direct cut with that um, with that false edge, it's medieval martial arts, European martial arts would call the back edge the false edge simply because it's the reverse side of the primary edge. I don't know if you turn it around, does it now become this, become the primary edge? I don't know. But anyway, so you, you can, you know, swing this relatively quickly and, and directly, you know, onto the opponent and you will get reached with that cut. So if you have obviously a pretty simple handle here. You can switch it easily from forward to reverse grip or forward grip to edge up grip, let's call it. Uh, so it makes sense for a weapon like this to use in the edge up grip. Another useful place to use the edge up grip is when you have a trailing clip point is on that back cut, you get to use the full length of the blade. So if I come in with just a tip, I can get a cut there because it's angling in, it's kind of a combination of thrust and rip. Uh, when you cut with a, let's turn this bit, when you cut with the primary edge, you're essentially aiming for a, the point of percussion on the blade as your impact point. And on buoy knives, that generally tends to be opposite of the, where the swedge begins. That's where you have the most weight and the most impact efficiency with your cut. So you're cutting with that point of percussion and you get a more efficient cut like that, but you notice you do lose some blade length compared to, you know, cutting with the tip on edge up fighting. So it's something to think about. Okay, let's talk about some potential problems with the trailing point. And even here, these come in when you have an extreme trailing point. I'll describe this in a minute. Um, most Latin machetes uh, have a straight back and a, a pretty gentle curve here. So the point is, is not really conducive to thrusting through fibrous material. Um, can be done, but that's dependent a lot on the cutting edge, how sharp that is. You notice you have these three swept back points are not too severe. You have, uh, let's see, the two Ontarios here, the SP10 and the SP5, and you have the Ricardo Villar jungle buoy. Uh, they have trailing points, but they're, they don't come above the spine. And I, the reason I mention that is because you do see some uh, let's say they call it the, the uh, panga machete 
uh, from Africa. It's sold all over the world, but I think the original design from Africa. Where if you take a line from the spine, the point does come up above that. And that puts two forces on that point. Normally you would have, you know, leverage coming this way on a, a point of a blade. But with the that severe trailing point, you're now getting a lot of torque on the tip when you twist the blade. And the way machete manufacturers prevent this from being a problem is they simply, you know, temper it, temper the machete with a softer temper than you would for a bowie knife or a knife in general. So this is likely to flex. A machete is likely to flex and not bend. You can even see this on this Latin machete. You know, it flexes very easily. It's not going to break. Where doing that with a blade tempered as a knife, you're much more likely to snap it. So if you're having a blade designed for yourself, uh, keep that in mind that this type of tip, the severe sweeping clip point, really only comes on uh, machetes, effectively. You don't want to do that on a on a knife. You may uh, snap the tip if you're using it, you know, for camping survival use, where you're going into something hard like wood. So when I was at one of the Ashokan knife making seminars, uh, Dan Morogny told me an interesting story about when he and Lynn Thompson were designing the Trailmaster. So here's a, a knockoff of the Trailmaster, but here is a blade from the Recon Scout, you know, very similar design, uh, similar thickness of stock, just a little shorter. And the idea was they originally started trying to do a, a, a sharpened swedge on the back, as you see on this Ontario SP-10. Uh, but what they found was that made the tip too thin and that you know, in order to have enough of an angle to get a sharp swedge, they had to come, you know, deeply into the blade. Uh, and they found that, you know, in their stabbing test where they, you know, stab a, a log and then wrench the blade over this way, the tips would snap if they had too thin a tip. So having a unsharpened swedge reinforced the tip. Now, you see, there's a false edge here. There's a bevel here, but... It's easy to illustrate on the difference between these two blades. So the um, Trailmaster and the Recon Scout have an inch and a half wide blade. If you look at this uh, 1917 buoy, it's an inch and three quarters. You go up to the SP-10, and it's a full two inches across. And what you find, at least I find interesting, is when you have this false edge here on a blade below two inches, for instance, on this 1917 buoy, it's about a quarter inch in that of that swedge, how deep it is. Whereas the a two inch blade, you have more room to get an effective swedge because there is a half inch of sharpened area here. So you know there's going to be a balance of how much the blade weighs uh, and how thick you can make it. Here's a quarter inch of stock. Because you have a sharpened swedge, you still have it's fairly thin at the tip compared to a Recon Scout blade. You can feel, I don't have a, a, a proper accurate micrometer, but it's it's close to twice the thickness, let's say a quarter inch from the tip. Uh, and you can see, I don't know if you could see that there, but there's a definite difference in thickness towards the tip. So another difference I would say between a fighting buoy and a survival buoy, let's say, is do you sharpen the swedge or not? And that's going to be dependent on the width of the blade. Uh, Dan 
told me that he and Lynn were trying to keep it to, you know, a reasonable weight um, and a reasonable thickness, a certain size. So if you have an inch and a half wide blade, that does not give you a lot of real estate to do an effective sharp back edge in a swedge without reducing too much meat in the tip. So a survival buoy, in my opinion, uh, should be single-edged. You, know, you might have a bevel here, uh, but not a full sharpened back edge. Where if you're looking to design a fighting buoy, or let's say a pig hunting buoy, uh, then you need a wide enough blade, this is two inches, at this point you need a wide enough blade to give you enough real estate here to get an effective angle, a shallow enough angle, to get an effective sharp back edge. Okay guys, one last factor we're gonna look at in our examination of buoy knife design is the length of the blade. And there's two parameters here. One is the overall length of the blade and the other is the length of the swedge. And the reason for that, reason for that is simple. The point of percussion, or the point where you have the most bang for your buck, uh, most impact on most buoy knives, tends to be opposite of where the swedge begins. So you'd want to hit or cut right there. You still have, you know, that sweeping trailing point to continue your cut, but you're getting the best balance point for your hit opposite the point of where that swedge begins. That's where the, the weight is. And obviously the longer the blade, the longer the lever, the better the leverage. And when you're cutting on a swing, you're essentially making mechanical leverage with that swing. Now, another factor is the length of the swedge itself as a portion of the blade length. I tend to like short swedges of about one quarter of the overall length because that gives you a longer full width blade, gives you more weight towards the end. So you can hit harder, cut harder, more work chopping wood, etc. Uh, this plays an important part if you are just if you decide to fight in that Jim Bowie style of edge up. In that, let me turn this around so you can see, you're essentially cutting or striking with your spine against his uh, cutting edge, right? You're drawing a block from him, like you saw in one of my previous videos, and you're attacking his cutting edge. Obviously, you want to be hit as far up from his hand as possible. Possible. The longer the lever, the better the leverage. However, you don't want to go too close to the tip. It's easy to slide off. So the best point for me, in my opinion, if you're going to do this technique, is use your point of percussion, the end of your swedge, or the beginning of your swedge, end of your spine, against the point of percussion on his edge. You have a better chance of uh, damaging or even breaking his edge that way. And you have more leverage to overturn his blade and get it out of the way. Uh, another thing about blade length, though, is, you know, back in the days, Jim Bowie said that uh, I've seen several sources that said his blade was about uh, 12 to 13 inches long. This is a 12-inch uh, uh, model 1917 Bowie from Cold Steel, and I believe the the width was about two inches, like you have on this uh, SP10 from Ontario. So it's a pretty big blade by today's standards. In the 1830s and 40s, when the Bowie knives first started to become uh, popular in the U.S., you know this was a time period where uh, firearms were not very reliable or not quick firing. You had single shot black powder pistols uh, and rifles. So the blades were fairly long. This was your, your primary backup weapon. After you fire a pistol, uh, rifle or pistol or both, this was your main weapon. Now this is your only weapon you could bring into play. So the blades made sense for the blades to be this big. Uh, during the Civil War, you see a lot of Confederate bowies uh, with fairly large blades or basically short swords. You notice after the Civil War, once we got reliable repeating arms 
and reliable metal cartridges. Then you saw the blades began to shrink. So this is a, a nine and a half inch blade on this Ontario SP-10. And as metal cartridges and reliable repeating arms came up in the general use, you saw the blades get smaller and smaller and smaller. I've seen some cowboy utility buoys down to a, a six and a half inch blade. You know, you realize that, you know, in the days before reliable firearms, a big blade made a lot of sense. So guys, I've uh, really been enjoying this examination of the Bowie knife I've been doing for the last several years. You know, there is a lot of mythos around the Bowie knife. I remember one historian calling it the American Excalibur. Uh, it, but it's not a magic blade, but it is very versatile. Uh, if you look at it, you know, from a survival knife perspective, thick spine, not likely to break, a good point if you need to pierce things, uh, not only, you know, for defensive use against uh, dangerous men or animals, but, it, you know, if you need to pierce hides, if you need to uh, drill holes for uh, various, you know, bushcraft uses, uh, if you need to chop things, chopping wood, you know, that thick spine, that long length gives you... Some heft there, you can get that job done. Single edge, uh, for the most part, that spine can be used to break nuts, to break crab shells, etc., etc., uh, crush things. Um, we've already gone over the defensive uses of that back swedge. You know, so yes, there's hype to the Bowie knife, but it's a versatile design. Look at that, that belly means you can use that for skinning. Um, you have a spine you can hold on to, use it as a draw knife. So it is a very versatile design. Uh, you know, a blade that has an equal amount of hype would be the Kukri. And it's very also equally popular these days among uh, outdoor survival uses. And it it is also, again, a very, very extremely useful tool. But one thing with the Bowie knife that I've heard from uh, several Special Forces guys when I originally posted uh, some comparisons of Bowie's versus Kukri's uh, on my YouTube channel was they prefer the Bowie knife if they're going through dangerous territory, if they need to use it against uh, you know, as a survival tool or a defensive tool against men or animals, especially dangerous game. They said they wanted the longest Bowie knife they could have with a good sharp point, because, you know, make trying to stab a bear with a pointy stick ain't going to do it. And they would actually mount this on a pole and use it as a spear, at least while they were traveling. Uh, so if they were attacked suddenly by a dangerous animal, uh, they would much rather stand far away with a pointy piece of steel on a end of a long stick than try to hack it while it's up close with a kukri. So, like I said, a very... You know, versatile tool for a lot of uses. So something that still is practical for today. And guys, I encourage you to please send those questions in. Uh, a lot of uh, my examinations are done because they're inspired by your questions. And I've really been enjoying them. So please keep it up. All right, this is Torn Bill signing off. Train hard, but train smart.